Start delay is really useful if you want to be in the picture or if you are in a situation where, for instance, you're putting your gigapan unit and camera on a hot air balloon and setting it up in the sky. Not that I've done that myself, but you can imagine doing that. So start delay allows you to go in and say, when I say start the panorama, don't start for 15 seconds, 30 seconds, and you can keep going up to 10, 15 minutes. So you can essentially delay the entire panorama acquisition to whatever you like. That's start delay. Next, multiple shutter. This is a feature that's on Epic 100, but not on the Epic. Multiple shutter is, is suggesting, instead of taking just a single picture at that location, take multiple pictures. And that's fantastic if you intend to take multiple pictures and do some kind of high dynamic range work with that, uh, or uh, multifocal planing work. Factory reset is doing the obvious thing. Expert options. Um, expert options are interesting. It's worth taking a quick look at them. Button hold is this question of whether you want the robotic finger to continuously press the shutter button for the three seconds that it's pressing it for, or to press it and release it. Some people feel that pressing it continuously induces less vibration, because you're not actually moving it twice. And so there's a debate there, and you can play with it and let us know what you think. Checklist allows you to set whether you want a checklist to be shown or not. Uh, just now when I used the GigaPen, there was no checklist. But there's a nice checklist you can turn on that asks you questions like, did you fix the white balance? Did you lock the focus? Did you lock the exposure? And so checklist is very useful for these kinds of operations. Shutter method is asking the question, are you using the robotic button pusher, or are you using some other technique for using the shutter, like a remote trigger or a manual point? So the remote port, if you were to hit OK, says, I'm actually using the remote port to uh, trigger this with a trigger. Uh, manual is saying, the human being is going to press the button on the camera, so don't worry about pressing the button for me. And that's it. Picture ordering is another really interesting menu. Let me go ahead and enter that and show you what's going on. Right now, we're in column mode. And column mode means we start at the top left. We take our picture by running down the column and coming to the right and doing that again. So we're taking the picture a column at a time. Uh, instead, we could actually choose to take the picture in row mode or, or uh, down or row mode up. Row mode down means we start at the top and we scribe down. Row mode up means we start at the bottom and we scribe up. Let's talk about why you would want to use these modes. Typically, if you're capturing something where the light's changing rapidly or there's motion, say a sunset, it's very important to you that the adjacent pictures are taken quickly in rapid succession. So row mode makes a lot of sense. In fact, I'll often take sunset shots with row mode up. Because as the sun sets, the grass in front of the sun is going to become dark quickly. So I want to capture the grass, capture the sunset at just the right time, and I can even pause it and then continue it when I get to the horizon at just the right moment. And then I want to capture the sky as it's very colorful as the sun sets. And again, you could pause it if you want for fun, wait for the color of the sky to start to become quite saturated, and then take the pictures. Uh, by the same token, Row mode is really useful if you're looking at a really crowded situation, like a baseball game, and there's motion. Because people don't move up and down, they move sideways. So the faster you can take the pictures sideways, the better. And column mode turns out to be really nice for landscapes where nothing's moving, uh, just because I'm used to it. And I enjoy that I'm getting some sky, making sure the exposure is right, getting the ground, making sure the ground looks good. So it really tests the full range of exposures and distances for me on that very first column, and then I know everything's going to be good. So that's the uh, picture ordering situation. And there's a backlight mode and a motor mode and a firmware version, and that's it. So that's the expert options. Now we're going to move to the most important uh, menu of all at the top level. It's called Gigapan Setup. You've already noticed that we took that example panorama and the GigaPan robot had to move between pictures. Well, the question is, how did it know how many degrees to move? That depends. Depending on the camera you use, when you put it at full zoom, you may have to move 3 degrees. You may have to use, move 15 degrees between pictures. It's tricky because you want adjacent pictures to have some overlap, say 30% or so. You don't want 70 or 80% overlap because you're wasting your time and you're wasting camera and memory space. It's just too much overlap. You don't want too little overlap because the stitcher needs to have enough pixels in common in the scene that it can calibrate and align those pictures just right. So it needs details. 
that match up, like that pine tree in the distance being in both pictures, so that it can make sure it's, it's perfectly aligning everything and creating one seamless panorama. So GigaPen setup is going to allow us to do that, and I want to just show you how that works. So we're going to hit, go ahead and hit OK, and then we're going to go up and down to the camera and show you what you do. Current field of view, 10.8 degrees. Now once you do this a few times, you'll know what the right field of view is for your camera. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK to change it. It's going to say use buttons to align horizon with the top of the camera screen. Of course, first you want to set your camera to whatever zoom you're intending to use. I'm zoomed forward all the way, which is what I want. And what I'm going to do is just pick something in the image, in this case the white cable there. And I'm going to set it by going on the up-down button until it's on the very top of the screen. Then I hit OK. And it says reference set. Then it says use buttons to align the horizon, or that object, with the bottom of the camera screen. So now I'm simply going to use the up button to move that cable down. Now as I move that cable down in the image, it's showing me the current degrees field of view as measured by the stepper motors. So right now I'm 4.2 degrees, there's 5.8 degrees, and so on. I'll move the tip of that cable right to the bottom of the screen. Don't worry about overlap, it'll compensate for overlap for you. And I'm at 11.5 degrees. Maybe I'll go down a little bit. Right there, 11.7 degrees. 11.5. All right, we hit OK. So now we've physically measured the field of view of the camera in the top up-down direction, and the robot now knows that number. That number is remembered by the robot even when you turn it off and take the batteries out. So as long as you're using the same camera, fully zoomed in on the same robot, you don't have to worry about that number. Of course, something that makes a lot of sense is while you're taking gigapans with the camera, look at the pictures that are getting taken. Find something in the picture, and when it goes to the next position, make sure what you're seeing is a reasonable amount of overlap between the pictures. So again, you and your eyeballs and brain checking on the robot and making sure it's doing the right thing, there's no substitute for that. Okay, that's the set of uh, gigapan setups that we need to know about so we can actually take a picture. I'm going to go ahead and go to the top level, go back to new panorama, and show you a few more tricks in taking a new panorama. So just to review this, we're going to take a new panorama by making sure the robot is ready. In this case, it's still got the same exposure settings it had before. We're going to hit OK. We're going to set the upper left. And now let's try and be careful of focus. So we're going to go on the top left of that early gigapan. And it's going to say set lower right. So we'll go down to the bottom right corner of the gigapan unit, the beta unit on the right. I should say the beta unit on the right. So there's a 6 by 3 gigapan. And by the way, I'm at a 6 by 3 gigapan. That's 18 pictures. But it's 18 pictures, and we don't have a real feel for whether we're at the very edges of what it could be at 30% overlap. I can go down and right all the way to there before it goes to 7 by 4. So you can actually play that game if you wish so you're capturing the largest space you can with those 6x3 pictures. Um, what it'll otherwise do is basically squish them together to get exactly the top left and bottom right corners that you're asking for. So I'm going to hit OK on that, but now I'm going to play a game to make sure I get the best focus that I can, just to show you an example. The first thing it says is show panorama, yes or skip. I'm going to say skip. I don't want to see the panorama. Take 18 pictures, yes or cancel. I'm going to say yes. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay careful attention to the robot as it takes the pictures. If the picture looks focused, fine. I've got autofocus on. If the picture doesn't look focused, I'm going to pause it and show you what I do. So, taking panorama, press X to pause. Column 1, row 1, off it goes. And it gets a picture in the dark, and it's actually well focused. So it goes to the next position and gets a good picture. And here's a picture right below my business cards. Oh, that was really fuzzy. So I'll pause this. I paused it, but the robots moved on to the next picture. So I'm going to go back one to go back to the bad picture. So this is the picture that was bad, right? So what I'm going to do is put my hand out here, make sure that it can focus well by pushing halfway down, and then I'll take the picture. There we go. Much better focus. And now I'll tell it to continue. I'll go forward one to the next position, because I took that picture for it. And now I'll hit OK, go ahead and continue taking pictures. So don't feel shy about getting in the way of the robot that way, making sure that it's taking a good picture for you. Uh, you could even have gone in and changed to manual focus mode. 
No, I'm going to go ahead and stop this because we don't actually need all these pictures. So now we've covered the settings that the GigiPan Epic has and the Epic 100 has in terms of setting up your image and your picture and your panorama and making sure that you're in tune with the robot and the camera and how long the camera is taking to take pictures. And we've gone, give, gone over the camera. Now let me just talk about uh, one more advanced issue, which is vignetting, and then we're done. So vignetting. The problem that you got is that a lot of these cameras, including the G11, when you zoom them in all the way, especially when you have that wide open aperture that I said is good, what will happen is the light beams coming in through optics that aren't perfect. They're not thousands of dollars worth of optics. And they're hitting an imaging chip that is pretty small. And the boundaries of the image can be quite dark. Now, this isn't typically a problem if you're taking pictures of grass or forest or trees or people. But if you have something that's really homogeneous and bright in a color but not saturated, not bright white or black, so let's say the blue sky, you got a problem. Because each of those pictures that it's taking of the blue sky, the middle of it is bright and the edges are dark. So when the stitcher gets done, the picture is splotchy. So what you need to do is understand what it takes to make vignetting as small a pos as possible a problem. First of all, good cameras, the better the camera, the better the optics, often the better the vignetting, and you can ask that question. Second of all, you can do post-processing, so you can programmatically go in and correct the pictures for vignetting, and much more advanced cameras actually have lenses that are designed to correct for vignetting. Third thing you can do, keep the aperture a little smaller. So try making the aperture smaller, see if that solves part of your problem so that you don't have as broad an aperture and as much of a fringe of the lens being used. And those are the kinds of issues that you need to think about whenever you have that beautiful blue sky and you want to get one beautiful homogeneous uh, piece of blue sky captured. So good luck with that. That's the vignetting problem that you'll see. Remember though that making your aperture small introduces the other problem. Uh, which is diffraction. So if you make your aperture really small to try and get away from vignetting, eventually you're going to lose some sharpness because of diffraction. So there is a happy medium, and you want to try and, and forge toward the medium as much as possible. Now the SD780 is a great educational unit because it's inexpensive, and it's tiny, easy for kids to use. And I want to show you briefly how you fix the exposure uh, and, and the focus on this camera because it's not quite the same. Everything else in the menus is exactly the same, but the way you fix the exposures is a little different. And I've put it in program mode. I'm going to zoom it in all the way. So in those senses, it's very much similar to the camera we were using before. But here's the trick with fixing exposure, which again is very important. You always want to fix exposure. So on the SD780, what you need to notice, first of all, is there's a little donut here around the function set button. Now function set and the donut exist on the bigger cameras. Here it's just much, much smaller and harder to see. And ordinarily, you would use the donut to do things like turn the flash on and off, which of course is important, and turn on the timer. And as you'll recall, the timer is great because you can use it to introduce, for instance, a two-second delay so that at night you can get great gigapan shots. The donut is also not labeled this way, but you can use it to lock the exposure and the focus, and that's very important. So here's how would you do that. We can push down the shutter, and then we can push up on the top of the donut where there's a blue rectangle, and it locks the exposure, it makes the adjustment itself. So it decided one-fifth of a second, f5.8. But the good news is it's locked now. So all the pictures will be at that same exposure. So you'd have to hunt to find the right place to lock the exposure like that for your overall panorama. To lock focus, you push down halfway on the shutter, and you hit the left side of the donut where the mountain and flower are. And then AFL shows up, autofocus lock, and now all the pictures will have that focus point. Again, very useful in certain situations, although I do recommend that you play with having focus in autofocus mode some of the time with GigaPan.